Just tell me when to hit broadcast and I will. Oh, uh, it's, already it's, it's already broadcasting. You're broadcasted and you're recording. Yay. Oh, here they, oh, they're all rolling in now. Hello, everyone. Hi. I'm so glad all of you have power. <laughs> Judy Shapiro's here. She's the curator at the Transit Museum. I'm excited to see her. Claude, do you recognize any friends? You know, I, I, uh, I see that there are participants, but I can't see everybody right oh, now. So uh, if you click on, uh, on, on participants, then, and then you'll get a sidebar, and then you can see all the attendees. Oh, there they are. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see, I see some people that I recognize. Wow. Oh wow! Someone's coming coming in from Paris. Um, someone's from someone's in there from. Someone here from uh, the just said hi from Paris. Hey Claire. <laughs> this is great. All right, we'll probably begin in about five minutes, just because with all the power outages and everything, we want to make sure people can connect. Um, Shout out oh. to Katie. Hey Katie. <laughs> Our, our intern, Sarah Sloan. Sarah, no, sorry, Sarah's not an intern. Sarah works in the shop. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> oh, someone here is from Argentina, Denver. It's a worldwide thing. Yeah, the Bronx. Katie says she's really excited to see this, Claude. Oh, beautiful. Awesome. We have a lot of representation from the Bronx. That's awesome. Yeah, because I heard some people in the Bronx had a power outage. Just, just a few. Um, Portland, cool. Harlem, that's basically where I'll be in a few weeks. Um, Long Island, awesome. Okay, well, as people slowly roll in, um, let me just say hello to everyone. Um, first, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's an incredibly blustery day and my internet went out, Claude's internet went out, New York City's power went out. Um, so it's crazy out right now. So thank you so much for being so dedicated um, to come to this this evening and we really appreciate that. Um, now for anyone who doesn't know, I'm Angelina Lippert. I am the chief curator of Poster House in New York City. And that is the first museum in the United States dedicated to the art, history, and impact of posters. Now I met Claude Johnson um, a few years ago at a conference and I quickly realized he was the coolest person in the room. Um, as someone who knows nothing about sports, me, um, learning about the history of the Black Fives era in basketball has been an eye-opening, exhilarating experience. And I'm so glad that we get to share it with you this evening. Um, now, Claude is a historian, a writer. He's the founder of the Black Fives Foundation, which is a 501c3 public charity whose mission is to research, preserve, showcase, teach, and honor the history of pre-NBA African-Americans in basketball. Um, now its trademark slogan is Make History Now, which you will see on Claude's lapel button, um, and which you will also see is incredibly appropriate given um, the tremendous information he'll be sharing with us tonight. Now, all the images you will see this evening, including the posters, which are of special interest to me, obviously, um, are from the, Black's Fla the Black Fives Foundation archives. And I strongly recommend um, checking out blackfives.org um, and also posterhouse.org <laughs> um, for future events, talks, and programming. Um, now, just some housekeeping. I'll be in the chat moderating while Claude speaks. So if you have a question pertaining to what he is showing on screen at that time, I can interrupt him with your question. But if it's not related to what's on screen, just save it till the end and we can have more of a conversation. Um, so now without further ado, Claude, take it away. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Angelina, and also Poster House. And uh, thank you to, to Val Crosswhite, Julia Knight, and everybody else on staff over there. It's a great team. And uh, if you haven't been over there on, uh, on 23rd Street in New York City, you, you really need to go. It's an amazing facility. They have great events. They have um, some incredible uh, items on display and a beautiful gift shop and a cafe. So 
uh, it's really an enjoyable experience once they open back up. I mean, every place in New York City is closed right now, practically. So um, unfortunately, you can't go there this second. But um, I, I look forward to, and I have, um, you know, a, a, a few slides and a thing, thing that I want to share with you in terms of just our, our, our overall mission and what we do. And I'm excited about that. So why don't we, uh, I'll, sh I'll start sharing the screen. Let's see if we can do this. All right. So if everybody can see that, uh, this is a, a virtual talk. It's, it's, um, it's about the racially segregated um, Black Fives era of basketball. So the Black Fives era was a period from the early 1900s, about 1904, when the first, um, when, when, when a man named Edwin Bancroft Henderson first introduced basketball to African Americans on a wide scale organized basis in Washington, DC, and I'll talk a little bit about him later, uh, through till 1950 when the NBA signed its first black players. And that period uh, we've called the Black Fives era. And, um, and so what, what, I, what I'm doing here is I'm just giving, first of all, just an intro, but also a little bit about our organization. And then of course this history, and I'm telling that story through a few posters that are in our archives and also that, are, um, that I've uh, tried to, let's see if I can get this to go. Yeah, here it is. That, uh, that I have, um, uh, a couple of them are, belong to a friend of mine named uh, Andy Sandler uh, to fill in a couple of the gaps. And I'll, I'll, share, I'll share those uh, in detail. So we've been around doing this since 2002. Um, it's, it's something that's been a passion of mine since then. I used to work uh, at the NBA and while I was, while I was uh, at the NBA, uh, that was when they were celebrating their 50th anniversary, it was 1996. And during that time, I learned that there were dozens of African-American basketball teams that played before the NBA but nobody knew anything about them and I couldn't find out, find out any more. The NBA didn't know, the historian there didn't know, the Hall of Fame. Uh, there were only a few academic papers and so as I started to look further, um, I discovered, first of all, how to do research and secondly, um, this, this uh, parallel universe, almost dozens and dozens of African-American basketball teams, players, contributors. Um, and, and during that time, I started writing and exploring and, and capturing the history um, chronologically and then also just items that were artifacts that nobody seemed to really care about. But, uh, and then getting in touch with, with teachers and with, with descendants of, of, of these, um, these contributors and individuals and pioneers. And so eventually, at first I had uh, a, a business that was, that, that was started that was a brand called Black Fives, but eventually I realized that there's a lot more to it than just selling t-shirts and, and items when I could really be supportive of a cause. And I, th I thought that uh, you know, causes are uh, much more meaningful, but also um, they're, they're, they're somehow intrinsic to what, we, uh, to what we're trying to do with this history anyway. Um, so in about 2013, uh, I created uh, a, a foundation, a 501c3, the Black Fives Foundation. And um, our mission is to research, preserve, showcase, teach, and honor this pre-NBA history of Blacks in basketball. And uh, so just taking a look at that for a second, you know, research really means getting the details, finding out exactly what happened, who were the pioneers. Preserving is, is you know, just making sure that we, we collect and save artifacts, um, whether it's photographs, uh, ephemera, whether it's um, objects, items, 
uh, everything from ticket stubs to posters. Um, we don't have a lot of posters. It's a very rare thing, but we have a few that we can show. Um, and then showcasing, which is just taking that information and, and broadcasting it out and making sure as many people as possible know about it, whether it's through a museum exhibition, a talk like this, or even through merchandise, which we, we every once in a while have a chance to do through partnerships. Um, and then teaching, which is of course going out in front of kids, but also through our website and just as an overall, uh, as, as an overall thing that, that we do in terms of the activities. Uh, we've also been fortunate enough to speak in front of NBA teams, to players, uh, to staff, to personnel, um, college teams as well, colleges. And then the honoring part has to do with really just advocacy for these pioneers, making sure that they get their proper recognition, making sure that um, you know, they're, they're elevated to where uh, they belong. And that includes advocacy with the, with the uh, Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame and other organizations that, that recognize these pioneers. And it's, I say pre-NBA because really it goes up to 1950. Um, in 1950, the NBA signed its first black players and that's, that's where our part of the history ends. Other people have picked it up from there. And then we have this slogan, make history now, that, uh, that Angelina talked about. And when you, when you contemplate that slogan, it makes me say, well, how can we play a more active role in helping to dismantle white supremacy and systemic racism. You know, all this time we've been talking about just elevating and promoting and, and, and saving the history, but what if there's something we can do? What if there's something behind our slogan? Because our slogan is a call to action. It's make history now, not, not someday, um, you know, not anytime, but right now. So that's where we're exploring making more of a difference and maybe we can be a portal uh, into just further discussions of awareness uh, of, of, of this history, not only the history but the role that systemic racism played. Why was there even a Black Fives era? Why were teams uh, racially segregated in the first place? What, there shouldn't even be a Black Fives foundation, honestly, right? So we've uh, put out some messaging that's been very well received um, about a call to action for dismantling systemic racism, but also uh, specifically where we might come in is that we're calling for education reforms to include mandatory courses and curricula in black history of all kinds across all disciplines for all citizens, all races at all levels. It just means the more we find out and understand where we came from, it's more important than ever. Um, for black people and for white people now to understand this history so that we can really appreciate the effects of it, but also um, you know, the, the contributions that were made. So just in terms of research, here's a couple of examples of more just to symbolize that there were many teams, there were women's teams, men's teams. There's lots of scrapbooks and information and articles that we have in terms of being able to reference for for, uh, for research. Um, preservation is, is items like these antique, but then state-of-the-art shoes uh, that were basketball shoes from, from, from back in around 1905, right around that time, the first book called How to Play Basketball, a very different game back then, but this, the same rules applied. Um, and then showcasing would be, it, here's an example of a, a display that was put up by the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library a couple of years ago. And it uh, was up for almost a year and it really explained and, and, and showed how this era was part of a bigger uh, social consciousness, social justice, social cause um, effort uh, in terms of black culture and attempts to elevate and to, to stay um, recognized uh, dur during their time and during our time. Um, and then education, teaching, you know, this is at Barclays Center and, you know, this uh, young man is holding 
a ball that is, uh, that is a laced vintage basketball. And the, you know, what I find is that there's just a great deal of fascination. Um, that same ball I, I showed to the Oklahoma City Thunder and Russell Westbrook when he was there and, and the guys, Chris Paul, and, and, and they're all um, just as fascinated because it's really, it's really amazing to see how, how could this ball have been used? How did they inflate it? Um, how did it bounce? Uh, and so just a couple of little points of trivia. Um, the court used to be surrounded by a cage. That's why it says screen and cage right there. The key, which we know as the, the key, used to be literally shaped like a keyhole. That's why it's called a key. And um, they had to change it when t uh, big guys like George Mikan came into basketball because they could just reach over um, and score without, uh, without worrying about a three-second play or a three-second call. Um, another little bit of trivia is how did these positions get their names? So in the old days, the, the Black Fives era, there was a left forward, a right forward, a center, a left guard, and a right guard. And it was the guard's job to guard the basket. That's why they're called guards. And they would also rebound and pass the ball up to the forwards. The forward's responsibility was to score. And the center's job, for the most part, was to um, jump, uh, jump uh, to uh, get the jump ball because after each made basket, again, this is very early, uh, after each made basket, there would be a center jump, a jump ball. So, I mean, they all obviously played at all parts of the court, but this was a f typical five-man uh, team uh, in terms of um, where the positions uh, would start. And so you see the one, the two, the three, the four, and the five. Uh, this uh, vintage photo of a YMCA with a running track gives you a hint about why um, the basket is 10 feet off the court. And it's, it's actually because when James Naismith nailed the peach basket to the gymnasium running track, it just turns out that architecturally the running track is 10 feet off the gym floor. So a lot, of, a lot of you all could probably still dunk if it wasn't for that architect. Um, and then in terms of honoring, uh, we have been fortunate and privileged to be able to work with facilities like the Barclays Center where we have uh, some murals, some life-size murals uh, permanently um, uh, uh, installed in the concourse. And this was at one of the celebrations. And then, in t and then you know, I mentioned the Hall of Fame. This is the family of, uh, well, some other inductees a couple of years ago, but also the family of Edwin, Dr. Edwin Bancroft Henderson, who's known as the grandfather of black basketball. And, uh, you know, with help from our advocacy, um, he was installed and enshrined into the Hall of Fame a couple of years ago. We've, we've helped um, get eight, uh, of those pioneers uh, enshrined into the Hall of Fame um, through research and, and, and advocacy on our part. And I'm, we're really proud of that. Uh, so let's get into the posters. Um, this is, uh, this is, so just to put, put these in context, there, there aren't many posters that are available but of the ones that, I, that we have in our archive and these, the other couple that I mentioned from, from Andy Sandler, um, I, I've, I'm gonna attempt, I'm attempting to tell a story with those that helps shed light on uh, what this history is all about and, and just what it might've been like um, from different angles, not just from the surface, but from behind the scenes of what might've been going on. Um, so this is a, a, a poster from the 1931-32 uh, season, uh, uh, sorry, the 33-34 season. And um, this team was called the, uh, the Philadelphia Giants, but they were only called the Giants when they, when they toured. When they were back home in Philadelphia, they were the Quaker City Elks. Uh, and so, um, so we get the very first almost conundrum is why did they change their name? And really, it's just because they were traveling and they wanted to um, 
they, they just wanted a different name for promotional reasons. Uh, it was exact same roster, exact same lineup. And what they did is in that season over the, this is in the Great Depression, during the Great Depression, they had uh, a, a really amazing team which uh, featured a, a man named um, Jackie Bethards, who was really an exceptional point guard. Uh, fantastic uh, ball handling skills, shooting all around player. And he's the person on the far left. Uh, so he's the, the, the man at the front of that line. Um, and what they did is during that season, they traveled to, to Massachusetts and New England. So this is in Northborough, Massachusetts. And the local promoter was a man named Billy Leonard. And he said, hey, the Giants have this great record. They've won 400 games in five years. Um, they're the biggest attraction and they're the colored champions. So right away, and by the way, BBC stands for Basketball Club, okay? AC stands for Athletic Club. So right away, we, we noticed, well, why were they called colored champions? I mean, why, why weren't they just called champions? Well, it's because because back then you had to signal ahead of time that a team was any good because you wanted people to, to show up. And um, they, they couldn't just be any old team. You had to give them some designation. And um, you'll see later that I'll, I'll come back to this story of why teams were called colored champions at all. And uh, in that same, that same year, um, Interestingly, and this is, this is a, a poster from, from Andy, uh, <laughs> what's interesting is, uh, notice the date. So January 25th, they came to Northborough and they, they had won 400 games in five years. But three weeks later, <laughs> they came back to, uh, to uh, where was this? Uh, St. Charles Gym in Waltham, Waltham, Massachusetts, and they had won 500 games in five years. Um, and don't miss them because you can see Jackie Bethart, they spelled it wrong, the greatest dribbler in basketball. He keeps the fans in an uproar. And the largest crowd of the season is expected. So, um, you know, again, uh, when you notice who created these posters, it wasn't the, the Philadelphia Giants, it was, it was the promoter. So you didn't really always know you know exactly what you're getting in terms of the facts but luckily there there are newspaper accounts and and you know we can sometimes uh, fill in the gap afterwards uh jackie bethards went on to play for the wrens and for the washington bears and i'll i'll have a couple of items about them um, next and what you can see here is just from local newspaper He's the ace of the Giants. He's one of the cleverest, smooth surface performers to ever grace the City Hall court. Uh, and, and many fine hoop men have performed on the same floor. Um, his wizardry at dribbling and shooting skill, intermixed with a sense of humor, keeps the fans hanging over their seats and makes, them, makes him an attraction uh, all by himself, in, and of, in, in himself. Besides the veteran Bethards, two newcomers, Clayton and Sinor, have proved worthy additions to the squad. Clayton is Zachary, Zach Clayton, who uh, ends up playing for the Wrens and also for the Bears. And he's now also through our uh, help enshrined in the Basketball Hall of Fame. So this is just way back before these guys really became big names, but they were, they were in newspapers nevertheless. And one thing to point out is still at this time, you had to put in a tinge of, hey, look, aren't they hilarious? Aren't they funny? Um, look at the sense of humor because, because it just wasn't accepted that they could just be great ballers that would just come uh, and dunk on you basically um, because it, it, you had to tone it down. You know, that was just the way things were in those days. Here's another poster of that same team, uh, same era. And again, they're featuring Bethard, the basketball star of stars. And, um, you know, they're talking about uh, some other things on this, but one of the, one of the things to, 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 uh, to point out is that 
um, they have a dance uh, way back even before the 19, before 1910, um, all the ads for basketball games were basketball and dance. And that's because they had an orchestra typically or a band uh, that played jazz or ragtime. And they played before the game, they played at halftime. And then they, they also played after the game and then there was a dance. And it, it made it so that these, these basketball games became meaningful social events where people that had migrated from the South um, could find out or seek other people who had just come to town or who had just come to that city. And, um, and, and, and they didn't have Facebook or social media back then, obviously. So this was a way to meet up uh, and find other people that were also uh, new to town or even just uh, to network with, within, within your social circle back then. Um, here's another, uh, here's another uh, poster. This one is also from, from Andy. And it comes from, um, let's see, this is from, this is from uh, 1931, the 1931-32 season. Um, and what's interesting about this, just zooming up, is that, uh, you, you know, it's still the world's college champions. There are some new players uh, that, that have been added. Uh, you can see on this one, you, in, if you, if you're really astute follower of, of basketball, you can see that there is uh, on the far left again, a man named Charles Tarzan Cooper, who is uh, enshrined in the Basketball Hall of Fame. He was the first black player that the Hall of Fame enshrined. And this was one of the first years that he was on the team. Um, there's also Fats Jenkins is in there, uh, Pappy Ricks, there's some other players. But one of the things to folk, the reason why I put this in here was because it says the cleverest and most scientific combination of basketball players on the court today. Um, to the naked eye, you'd say, well, wh what does that mean? Uh, yes, it's entertaining, but it, it turns out that scientific basketball was a thing. Um, going back to before the 1910s, here's the Buffalo Germans who are also in the Hall of Fame playing a fast and scientific basketball game for the championship of Buffalo. They beat the Knickerbockers. Um, I didn't even know the Knickerbockers existed back then, but I guess they did. They got beaten 39 to 11. Um, a different Knickerbocker team. Uh, and then um, the 23rd Street YMCA was, uh, was promoting scientific basketball. Two words, basketball was two words up until the 1930s because they were going to play the Poughkeepsie YMCA. I, I wonder if the, if the 23rd Street YMCA is the same building that the poster house <laughs> is in now. We should look into that. Um, here's uh, an all black team, two all black teams, the Hampton uh, University, Hampton Institute team playing Lincoln University. And the game was fast and clean throughout. It was a fine exhibition of scientific basketball. This is from the 1910s. And then Nat, Nat Holman, who coached um, City uh, College of New York uh, in the 1930s, all the way up through the 1940s and 50s, um, uh, wrote a book called Scientific Basketball. He ended up playing, uh, was a former player uh, for the New York original Celtics, and he's also enshrined in the Basketball Hall of Fame. So scientific basketball was a thing, um, but it was so much of a thing that all of a sudden, actually, it was too much of a thing because it turned out that in a way, you, they were the, the black players, the black teams were running too fast. They were passing too much. There was the pivot play. Uh, there was too much action. So if you read this, this is actually uh, that, that perfection, right? Which is this style of play that the Wrens played, robbed the game of speed and color. Um, and that's interesting, right? Because if you read this, it says basketball's progress toward tactical perfection reached such a point during the 1931-32 season that in many sections of the country, the game became so scientific as to no longer be interesting to the average spectator, right? So in other words, these <laughs> teams would, would, uh, would crush so much 
that you had to figure out a way, okay, wait, they're crushing us too much. Hold on a second. And, uh, but to be fair, at this time, this is when they installed the 10 second rule for bringing the ball past mid court and the three second rule for staying in the lane. But you got to wonder because the following year, the Rens won 88 straight games in 86 days. And for that feat, which was pretty amazing, uh, they, uh, they were enshrined in the Basketball Hall of Fame as a team, the 1933 team. And now we get to another um, part of, of this topic that I, that I want to address, which is that here are these men. Uh, these are uh, Tarzan Cooper on the left, uh, Clarence Fats Jenkins in the middle, and a man named Pappy Ricks on the right. And, um, you know, they look like, uh, like, you know, good looking, handsome, physically fit, normal citizens of the United States. But yet, here's this poster, which uh, the same year for February 26th, uh, the Wrens are coming to visit East Syracuse, and they're going to play a game, but this cartoon depicts those same three men almost as if they're not human. So you have Tarzan Cooper in the middle, and he's saying, he's saying, what are you going to do with it when you get it? Give me the ball, Tarzan, is what Fats Jenkins is saying. And Pappy Ricks is saying, shake it up, give me that ball. So you, you have to sit there and wonder. Some people probably thought, wow, that's hilarious, isn't it? But it wasn't at all, um, especially when the same newspapers in that, in that, uh, in that town show Jack Dempsey as a regular human, right? Because it's in the blood. Same exact time frame. So um, you have to sit back and say, okay, why were they doing that? And, and why was that necessary? Why was it important that if a team came to play that was an, a black team, that they had to be depicted in this way? Was it because of fragility? Was it because the people who were going to watch this game couldn't stand the idea of somehow that white superiority being being brought into question and and that that's something that you know is open for discussion but uh i think that you know this is certainly a good hint that that might have been what it was um again this is a team that ended up uh winning the inaugural world championship of professional basketball, the New York Renaissance in 1939. And of the players on this uh, roster, um, you have uh, Tarzan Cooper, who's second from the left in the Basketball Hall of Fame, John Isaacs, who's in front of him in the Basketball Hall of Fame. In front of him is um, Pop Gates in the Basketball Hall of Fame. Second from the right is is Zach Clayton in the Basketball Hall of Fame. And uh, I, would, I would argue that Clarence Jenkins, who's at the front of that line again, is arguably also deserving of the Basketball Hall of Fame, if not, uh, if not one or two others in this, in this roster. Um, yet the New York Times still said they are a smooth working Negro Five. Um, but when, when uh, my friend John Isaacs got the championship jacket from winning that inaugural uh, world championship. He asked Bob Douglas, who was the owner of the team for razor blade. And then uh, he cut off the word colored so that it didn't say colored champ world champions. It just said world champions. And I think that's a fitting uh, thing for him to have done. Uh, a few years later, uh, this is uh, a pioneering illustrator, African-American illustrator named George Lee, who worked for the Chicago Defender. And uh, you can see how instantly the image of African-American players and athletes changed once uh, men like George Lee uh, took over. Um, and, once, and that's precisely the reason why it was so important to have um, 
African American newspapers around at that time. This is Zach Clayton playing for the uh, Chicago Crusaders. This is the 1939-1940 season. And speaking of them, here's a poster in our archives that features uh, the Chicago Crusaders, Western colored champions. Uh, they're featuring Fat Jenkins, formerly of the Wrens basketball team, BBT. Uh, he was the former captain of the Wrens. Need we mention of his achievements in basketball? Everybody knows. Uh, and they list some of the players on this team um, who have been around in the game. Uh, uh, if you notice, um, there's a gentleman on this team, his name is Big Dave DeJernit, and he was the, f he was the, uh, uh, he was the star of a, t of a, of a team, a high school team in Indiana that uh, went to the finals, the high school uh, basketball championship finals in Indiana for the first time. Um, and that was a, a big deal at the time that you know, uh, he, he, he was a pioneer in Indiana for that reason. Um, right or wire Chicago Crusaders, their headquarters were in Bronzeville on the south side of Chicago. And um, there's a letter that went with this poster where uh, Fats Jenkins, Clarence Jenkins, who was the manager and star of this team, he would say, he, what they did in those days is they would just send a letter to a city like La Crosse, Wisconsin. And it would just say, basketball manager, La Crosse, Wisconsin. And, and, and somehow the post office would figure out, oh, that must be this guy over here, and they would carry it over to whoever was the manager of the local basketball team. And they would say, hey, we're coming up, do you wanna play? And that was before, I mean, they had wires and they had uh, tele telegraphs and, and other things, but you, you, couldn't, you couldn't email or, or pick up the phone because sometimes you didn't know who that person was. But this is very rare and it's a, it's a beautiful poster that, that, that we have. Also the way that it was printed and uh, mass produced is, is quite interesting. And by the way, feel free to ask questions along the way. I know uh, we are, I'm going through a lot of material here. Um, here's, here's some fun, here's, here's a, a fun one as well. Um, this is the game of the century uh, Renaissance World Color Champions against the New Britain Pros, one of the outstanding teams in the country. And um, again, that reference to colored champions uh, had to be in there somehow. But we have to ask ourselves, why was this the game of the century? Well, it turns out that in this specific season, which was 1946, um, the, the, the Pros and the Wrens had already played twice. So this was the rubber match that was coming up. And also the pros were trying to get an invitation to that world professional basketball uh, tournament uh, that was gonna be held in March in Chicago. So if they won this, they might've had a chance or they might have a chance to, uh, to, to be invited. So for them, it definitely was um, possibly a game of the century. But there was another bit of drama that took place uh, in terms of why this was important. And by the way, I'm featuring um, Dolly King here because he was uh, featured on this poster. This is a, a two foot by three foot placard uh, board printed poster. And, um, uh, and, and it's, got, it's got Dolly King featured. And the reason why is because he was on, he, he's a, he was a, a big star not only for the Wrens, but also for Long Island University where, where he played. And he actually led them to an undefeated season in 1941. Um, and he's in the LIU uh, Sports Hall of Fame, but he quit his team halfway through the season because he knew he wasn't gonna be drafted because they weren't drafting uh, black players into the white leagues back then. Uh, so he quit midway through the season, even though they won the NIT that year, uh, in order to tour with the Renaissance because they were going out to um, participate in the World Pro Championship and also uh, the Rosenblum tournament, which was this other tournament along the way. And they had, you know, relatively lucrative prizes for the winners. 
um, in the thousands of dollars. And that was a lot of money back then, even when it was split up among uh, five or six or eight players. Um, but what something else that happened was that uh, these two players that are featured, it's, there was a preliminary game, um, and, you know, and it's misleading because on this poster, they put these two gentlemen who are players next to, next to um, these other marquee items, but it, it's not because they were linked to those, it's just because they were players on the, on the New Britain pros. Um, but before I get to them, because th that's part of the drama, uh, it's that um, this was played at the Stanley Arena in New Britain. And New Britain was known as the hardware city. And the reason it was known as the hardware city was because of Stanley, the Stanley works, um, Stanley tools. So if you go to your local hardware store, you can see Stanley tools there. And um, that's what the arena was named after. Um, in the meantime, they've been purchased by Black & Decker, so now it's Black & Decker Stanley, or maybe it's Stanley Black & Decker, I can't remember. Um, and the, the Bristol Tramps uh, probably still, still play up in Bristol. Um, and then they had the New Britain Girl Pros. But uh, Hank Gerhard and Al Moschetti were um, an interesting pair because um, Hank uh, Gerhardt used to play at this time for Seton Hall and uh, Al Moschetti was a former St. John's player and he won the NIT championship uh, with St. John's uh, coached by Joe Lapchick. But both of these players had been injured, um, significantly injured uh, leading up to this game in two different games with all black teams, uh, with the Harlem Yankees, which is a black team, and the Brooklyn Brown Bombers, which is also an all black team. And this was such a big deal that actually the local papers said, wait a minute, colored basketball teams appear to be bad medicine for the New Britain pros. Um, so that was another aspect that was um, you know, part of why this was the game of the century. But unfortunately, um, even though they could build stuff in uh, New Britain, um, they couldn't build a lead. And so the, the Renaissance beat them and they unfortunately didn't make it to the World Pro Championship, but they did become part of a, a pro league, the Connecticut Pro League the following year. They were inaugural members. So all was not lost. Um, and then speaking of uh, some of those players like Dolly King, he ended up playing for the Washington Bears. And this is that same, that same year, the following season, but later that year. So here's the Washington Bears and many of the players were former Rens players. Um, and they won the world championship of pro basketball in 1943. So this is a game on Thanksgiving night uh, against the Jersey City Reds. And uh, one interesting aspect about this poster, which is in our archive, is that um, it's play played at Turner's Arena. Um, the main arena in Washington, D.C. was called Uline uh, Arena. And the owner of that, of that arena refused to let Blacks uh, um, enter. So um, you, you couldn't, and it refused to let uh, black teams play. And they even refused um, to have any kind of interracial mixed boxing or wrestling or any other events, even though there was lots of protest and lots of letters to the editor. Uh, one of the people who was most active in changing that policy was uh, Dr. Edwin Bancroft Henderson. Uh, the grandfather of black basketball, because after he left the game, he ended up uh, becoming a civil rights activist uh, for, for the area in Falls Church as well as Washington. And um, through a lot of boycotting and protesting and also leverage with other events that were staged at, the, uh, at Uline, they eventually got them to, to change their tune. But in the meantime, uh, Turner's Arena was the place uh, to to go. So this is a, a, cool, a cool poster of that, uh, of that game. And the Bears won this game as well. Um, going more into 
uh, as I'm sort of wrapping up, slowly wrapping up here, um, more into modern times, this is a poster that Converse um, produced around 1990, late 1990s to, uh, to uh, promote one of their shoes. And it's got a photo of the 1939 Rennes team. Um, it might have been actually the 1938 Rennes team. Um, and they're promoting this shoe made with genuine heritage, but they forgot one thing, which was to get permission from the living players uh, to, to print their likeness. This was in New York City. So uh, John Isaacs was still alive. He's in the middle. And he and I were friends. And somehow this got around to, um, to him. And we were like, wait a second. You know, they, they didn't have permission. And through some negotiation and eventual legal um, maneuvers, uh, Converse uh, paid uh, all of these players um, uh, a, a settlement, basically. And um, the settlement was more than they had all made uh, through their entire uh, professional careers as basketball players. I mean, part of that was due to inflation, but part of it was also, you know, you're talking about a giant, a giant corporation. It, it, was, it was inadvertent, but, um, but, you know, it was one of the things, one of those things that made me realize, um, you know, again, even in modern times, these, uh, these players, uh, these pioneers might not be getting the recognition uh, that, they, uh, that they rightly deserve. And then finally, uh, this was one of our posters. When I started out, it was, it was Black Fives as, as a company, uh, blackfives.com. And I, I changed all of that to a nonprofit in uh, 2013, as I mentioned, but back then when I was trying to get more recognition, I created a label called the Physical Culture Supply Company, and uh, I focused on the logos of these teams, and, uh, and, and this, was, this was the first um, version of, of what, what we did. So this is actually a, a placard poster as well. And uh, I put this ad very similar to this in Slam Magazine, and um, the, uh, the uh, wardrobe director at BET, Black Entertainment Television, called me and said, wow, can you come see us? And then, you know, I brought my jerseys and I brought all this uh, paraphernalia. And then right after that, uh, we got a lot of uh, recognition and visibility on, on a number of different rap artists and, and music videos and, and so on, you know, at that time. So it, it led me to, you know, this, this period that we're in now, um, going into uh, a social awakening that's happening around the world. Um, we've had this, this logo, uh, this trademark, Make History Now for a long time. Uh, we've, been, uh, we've been doing this since 2002. And uh, I'm glad that we're, we're, we've reached this point. I'm, I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing, but we also, each of us, all have to do our part and just continue using whatever methods, whether it's a glimpse into basketball history, whether it's um, through, through posters or, or through other storytelling, um, get at this and, uh, and, make, and make a difference. Not, not someday, but, but today. Not anytime, but now. And that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much. That was awesome. We have we actually have a few questions. Somebody just asked if um, could you repeat the grand the Godfather of of basketball's name? They wanted to write it down. Yeah, it was Edwin Bancroft Henderson, Doctor Edwin Bancroft Henderson. Also, we have a question. Um, somebody says, "I'm so curious about the experience of female black basketball players during this time." I'm sure there weren't a lot of avenues for them to play, even in school, and she'd love to know more about them. Yeah, I mean, right from the beginning, that, that image I put up was of the New York girls, and uh, they were the first championship team. They were out of New York City. And um, what happened back then is that they would have uh, all of the, the men's clubs, like the these uh, teams were all associated with churches or social clubs or athletic clubs or um, other organizations, YMCAs, and they would all have a sister uh, team. 
And so the Alpha Physical Culture Club, which was the first African-American um, athletic club in the country, had a sister team called the New York Girls. And in that image, the coach of that team was a player from the Alpha Physical Culture Club. And this would take place you know, around the country. And the reason they did that was because it was social, because they would have a game, uh, the girls would play first, the guys would play next, and then all of them, including the, the teams they were hosting, would have a, a, get, a get together or a gathering, some kind of social networking, because especially if they were visiting from another city like Washington, that was a time to find out what are you all doing? You know, what's going on down there? What, what's, who are you listening to? What's the music? What, what's the conversation? How are the jobs? Whatever, whatever it was. And so um, there were, they were really dozens actually of women's teams leading all the way up through into the 1940s. And there's one team that I want to point out, which was the Philadelphia Tribune girls. Um, the Philadelphia Tribune was the African-American newspaper from Philadelphia. And they sponsored a team called the, the, the Philly Tribune girls. And um, they won the black national championship, women's championship 11 times in a row. Uh, and the star of that team was a woman named Aura Washington. And she was also a uh, star tennis player. Um, but again, through advocacy and elevation and recognition uh, or, or really showcasing of, of her story, uh, we were able to help get her enshrined into the Basketball Hall of Fame a couple of years ago. And she's now the, the, the earliest female enshrinee uh, in the Hall of Fame. So in other words, nobody in the Hall of Fame that's a, a woman's inductee uh, played or participated in the sport earlier than she did. And, you know, the sad thing is that after she left the game, um, she ended up uh, becoming obscure and working as a, uh, a maid, as a, as a domestic worker for the rest of her life as she died in obscurity. And so, um, you know, it's one of those stories where that's where the research comes in, that's where getting in touch with families, uh, finding out what's going on and, and, and promoting those pioneers as much as we can, that's where that makes a difference. Uh, Claire wants to know how you got Henderson into the Basketball Hall of Fame and if you could share the story of how that process goes. Well, I, I wouldn't say that I, I got him in or that we got any of these guys in. We just advocated for it. So obviously the Hall of Fame has their, their own process, but, um, but they, they've asked us to, to do research in the past and I've written the, 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 uh, the profiles of, of these uh, players in the past. And so um, years ago, as I was doing the research on, on, on uh, Edwin Bancroft Henderson, who, by the way, was much more well known as a civil rights advocate, um, but people didn't really know that he played basketball and that he, that he actually organized and was the first to, uh, to um, introduce basketball to black people on a wide scale organized basis through the segregated public school system in, in uh, Washington, DC. He had gone to Harvard University for a summer course to learn the game and how to play it and how to teach it. Um, so I, I actually contacted the Henderson family and I said, hey, did you know that your uh, grandfather and um, the, the work that he did, which was amazing, was actually predated by a lot of basketball activity. And I was looking at the Hall of Fame's, um, you know, prerequisites and qualifications. And it says here that if you made a difference that was meaningful and that was tangible and that could be documented and that was, uh, that was a body of work, um, that you could, you could potentially um, qualify. And I did a presentation uh, at the uh, DC Historical Society. I invited them. And then that led to or sparked um, several years of gathering more information and, 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 and pitching the Hall of Fame and, uh, and uh, them lobbying the Hall of Fame. And, and then some, one year they just said, oh yeah, you, we're gonna do this. And, and it, it's, it's also that, um, you know, they used to have a, a veterans committee I'm making it sound easy, but actually 
they had a veterans committee at the Hall of Fame that was, that was stocked with people that didn't know anything about this prior history. And that's why they would always get um, eliminated from the process. But what, uh, what is important to know is that at a, at a certain point, and I give the Hall of Fame a lot of credit for this, they decided to create a new committee called the Early African American Basketball Pioneers Committee, which was a direct elect. In other words, whoever they, that committee chose would go right into the Basketball Hall of Fame and skip the part about going through the Veterans Committee, becoming a finalist, and always getting shunted at that point. Um, and so after that happened, that's when a lot of these pioneers began to be in, enshrined. Uh, Jody asks, how many players have you been able to track down and how many are still alive today? Unfortunately, there are none alive anymore. Um, the, the last living uh, pioneer that was a Rams player uh, was a man um, named George Crow. And I had a, I just, it was a blessing that I was able to go out to visit with him at a nursing home in Sacramento shortly before he passed away. But we had a really great sit down um, talk and, uh, and uh, it, was, it was just a, a blessing uh, to, to get to know him uh, and his family subsequently. Um, and then I was friends with John Isaacs, who also, you know, by now has passed away, but we, we had a lot of opportunity um, to, uh, to, to not only do oral history and, and talk with him, but, but also to hear his uh, amazing storytelling. So there are very, I would say none. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, you know, we have a lot of material and, the, you know, we, we have a good head start on, on, some of, uh, on some of their stories. Uh, Jack McCollum asks, um, have you done much research about early black players in colleges and who in your estimation is the most overlooked early black player? Um, thank you for, those, for these questions, by the way. Um, yeah, I mean, in the early days, you had a different system. There was, there was an NCAA, but they didn't, ha they didn't have, a, they didn't govern um, the game the way that they do now. So you might have a game between Howard University and the St. Christopher Club, which was an independent club team. You might have a game between, um, between, uh, between Hampton Institute and a professional team even up in New York City. Uh, and so, you know, just because of that, uh, it was, it was, it was always, it was easy to, uh, to find out about some of the history of these teams and about the colleges themselves, but it wasn't the same as what we imagine, you know, tracking uh, NCAA history. Uh, at a certain point, the, the, the Big Ten and the, and the, uh, the uh, Southwest uh, Athletic Conference and other conferences, the Big 12, et cetera, started eventually allowing black players at all in the first place. Um, but, uh, but, you know, there, there are a number of black players who starred on early teams. Um, and and I, think, uh, I think that's a great question. Um, some, uh, Sarah wants to know, it, you mentioned that the dances happened at these events earlier. Is that why March Madness is called the big dance? Oh, that's, in, that's a great question. Um, I don't think that's why it's called the big dance. And, and, and here's why, because, because uh, there used to be a concept called Lent. And, I mean, there's still Lent now. For, for those of you who are practicing uh, Catholicism and you go to church and you get, you get ashes. Um, but back then, you, you, in basketball, there was a, a very specific and, and strict rule about playing basketball during Lenten season. And it turns out that if you look through the history of when Easter is and when Lent is and when Passover is, it's always during March Madness. So you, you, you weren't, if we were really still following Lenten rules, which, which uh, were imposed and practiced through the 1910s, uh, we would have never had March Madness during that time because, because the, the qualifying rounds and the finals are always 
during Lenten season, almost always during Lenten season. So um, I don't think that's why, but I, it's, a good, it's a good story to, to tell. Um, also, when these teams toured, was there a difference in the way the game was, play, was presented, um, whether the two teams were both black or if they were one black team and one white team, and if the audience was segregated or all black? Well, almost always the audience was all white. Um, and here's why. It's because, uh, so, even, so let's take the Rens as an example. Um, if, you, uh, if you can imagine, here's an all black team going out to, let's say, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, an all, pretty much all white state, an all white town, and they're invited out and they play the local team, they, they beat that team, they leave town, um, and then they get invited back. And this is during the Great Depression, during Jim Crow. So you have to ask, well, how did that happen? I mean, of course, there would have to be a collaboration, but also it's because this was during the Great Depression and people would come from miles around to, to uh, um, give their business to local uh, bars, restaurants, merchants, hotels. Um, so everybody made money, including the losing team, and um, this was a really big deal because you didn't have movies or radio or things to do. I mean, there wasn't anything to do unless an, some kind of novelty act came to town. And that, by the way, is why most black teams had to signal that they were black. So that's why you had the Harlem Globetrotters or the Zulu Kings or the, the Lion Tamers or, you know, and these, these were names that, that would signal to that town Oh, okay. And, and if, you didn't, if you didn't have that kind of a name, then you had to be really good so that they could put colored champions. So you had to let people know there's some black folks coming to town. And, and, that, and that's what it was. And sometimes once it became more evolved in cities like DC and elsewhere, where it was an all black audience or a mostly black audience, um, because those were two black teams playing um, and so, yeah, you, you often did have uh, a, a, uh, a mixed audience and you also sometimes had uh, a, a segregated, a mixed but separated audience, especially if you were playing down south. But what they did is they would go down south and they would play Tuskegee or another, an all black college or, or school and, or, 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 or a team. And, um, and, that's, and that's how, that's how it was, you know, back, back in those days. Now, you just mentioned the Harlem Glo Globetrotters. Um, somebody wants to know um, that they, more about them and how they fit into this, this era of basketball. Yeah, the Globetrotters were uh, an offshoot of a team called the Savoy Big Five that was formed in Chicago uh, in 1927. And um, a man named Abe Saperstein, uh, through uh, a squabble that they had, um, took off a, with a part of that team and formed the Globetrotters while the Savoy Big Five kept going. And they eventually became the, the uh, Chicago Crusaders, which, which was that team that I that had that poster of actually earlier. Um, but the, what, what's, what's interesting about the Globetrotters and Saperstein is he, he was a brilliant marketer and a visionary. Um, he was also, he also exploited uh, his players, but that's the balance that, um, that sometimes goes together in terms, of, in terms of the great success that they had. And the reason why I say he, he was a great success and brilliant is that uh, even though he opposed um, the racial uh, integration of the NBA, uh, he realized that he would no longer have a monopoly on black talent. And so uh, he took his players that he could and decided, all right, if I can't figure out how to keep being competitive because I'm no longer going to be a novelty, I'm going to start going overseas. So they got on a Pan Am flight and they went to Europe and they went to Australia and Asia. And that's how really the, the globe, that's where the second half of the Globetrotters story really starts. It's, it's when they became, they started getting televised and they started becoming uh, this amazing uh, star force. They had a movie um, and kids would watch this and their imaginations would 
would thrive on seeing uh, Marcus Haynes, for example, dribbling the way that he did, the ball handling. Um, and and the, the, the fun comedy part of it was, was, was a routine that, that was a carryover from the early days, but people don't realize that the Globetrotters were also a highly competitive team. Remember how I said that the Wrens won the inaugural uh, championship, uh, World Pro Basketball Championship in 1939? Well, the next team that won was the actual Globetrotters in 1940. I'm going to combine two questions here um, because they're both about the posters. Um, one, did the players have any input in how they were depicted in the posters? And um, was there a specific print house did, that did most of the posters or was it just a random output depending on the paper and the promoter? Uh, I am not an expert on the the paper and the printing, but I noticed from the markings that they're not always the same print house because often it would be the local promoter who would make that poster. It wasn't, it wasn't the the Globe Trotters or the Wrens or the local or the or the Giants who 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 printed that poster. It was it was the promoter, and so usually it was it was just uh, it would be really the you know the local printer wherever that wherever that was. Did I get did I get the whole question? Uh, I oh, and did the players have any input in how they were depicted in the poster? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know the answer to that, but I think that when you look at the way that players are posing, even on their photos, their their studio photos, there's a certain level of intent. There's a certain focus. There's it's it's like almost game face, but nobody's really thinking this is fun and funny and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to pose. And, and it's like, there's nothing funny about it because it's, it's not that there's, it's not that they're trying to be intimidating, but you can tell that there's something bigger at stake. This is a game we're playing and we're trying to make a living, but there's something else going on, which was this always this underlying feeling that what we're trying to do is show how elevated that we mean something as black people, as black men, as black women. And um, even, even though it's just sport, we're trying to use this as a way to show people, to show white people that we matter and that we're good as well. And even though we are getting diminished and um, marginalized and undervalued, um, we 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 come we still show up with the goods. Actually, that dovetails really well into the another question we have, which do you see any similarities in which uh, how black players from historically black colleges and universities are not scouted, and given the notoriety of predominantly white institutions in relation to this discussion? Yeah, and actually, um, I, I see another question here re referring to McCourt Maker. Um, from uh, that chose Howard University, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna also touch on that as well. Um, I mean, it's interesting because and it, this people have been talking about this for a long time. When the the Fab Five who went to Michigan at that time, there was some talk about, hey, wait, what if all of them had gone to Howard or Morehouse or someplace else? What would have happened? North Carolina A and T, Norfolk State, um, and uh, you could probably argue that they could have also won the uh, the uh, NCAA men's championship. I mean, they ended up not winning, but the point of it is um, they would have made an impact. And so, um, you know, the re and and because uh, the huge money right now is at these big schools like UCLA. Kentucky, Duke, um, that's where the players go right now. And that's why though, when McCour Maker, 6'11", uh, top 10, top 12 player in the country, high school player in the country, was uh, deciding between UCLA, Memphis, Kentucky, and Howard. Um, and then he chose Howard University. Um, and he said in his tweet, um, you know, thank you for, you know, 
the consideration. It was a really tough choice, but I chose Howard. So in that tweet, single-handedly, he equated UCLA, Kentucky, Memphis, and Howard University on the same plane. He said it was really tough, but he chose Howard. And why wouldn't you choose Howard if you're him, right? Um, he's, he's from, his uh, origin, his heritage is from Africa. He's got uh, cousins, brothers who play professional uh, basketball, one of them in the NBA. And um, why, would, why wouldn't you want to be around um, other black people who understand and can empathize and, 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 and get you, right? Uh, and then what's interesting is that's juxtaposed into a situation where we have uh, the NCAA is now at a crossroads, like a double crossroad, because do you have a football season or not? Do you pay players or not? Um, players saying, we're going to sit out if you don't give us further economic equality, racial equality, um, uh, uniform you know, protocols in terms of COVID-19. There's a lot going on in terms of players, not just at college, but also NBA, NFL, pro levels who are saying, wait a second, um, this equation isn't quite right. So, uh, so for McCourt Maker to do that, we actually gave him a nickname. His nickname is History, uh, because now it'll be History Maker. And every time he dunks, I expect that, that announcer to say, History, let's go. And he made history again. And so, you know, make history now. It's all about making this choice every moment. And, you know, I think that if Howard or any other uh, HBCU gets players like this, um, they're going to go deep into, you know, because e what happens is the NCAA has to give an automatic bid to the conference winner. So in the MEAC, it, let's say, if, or wh whichever conference you're talking about, CIAA, whatever it is, you're, you now have an automatic berth. So McCormaker Maker certainly could single-handedly, if he gets a couple more guys to go or play with him, get a bid for the NCAA. I mean, why not go to the Elite Eight, Final Four, and so on? And I think as, as more players see that, um, they're going to say, hey, that, that looks interesting to me. I might try that. Yeah. Um, somebody asks, uh, what's the long-term project you're working on currently and the biggest goal you want to accomplish? Uh, before, they say before the end of 2020, but I'm going to extend that to just with, with the Black Fives Foundation. Well, um, that's, that's a really good question. We're trying to uh, come up with, we're creating our, our concept paper now, actually. And we want to have an impact structure. We want to use um, the theory of change to make a difference. So we're re-looking at our, our, uh, our, our mission statement to really understand what are we what are we doing really is it just is it just these five things or is it is there something more um and so first it would just be to to gather up all of our resources and just try to understand strategically what what do we have what can we work with and what where where can we serve best right for the greatest highest good um but i think that for the most part our focus will be on uh, education, even indirectly. Um, and so uh, we look forward to uh, working in some capacity with an organization to create curriculums. Uh, we're redoing our website. Um, we will have some, some, uh, some merchandise and things like that, but it's more to establish and get interest from uh, as a brand. Um, but we, we want to, uh, <laughs> somebody put North Carolina Central, let's go. NCCU, um, you know, to, and, and so um, it's really just to continue to grow and expand and organize because we're not perfect. I mean, when I, almost always when I say we, I mean my echo, my shadow and me. <laughs> so it's really, uh, you know, been a, a labor of love, a, 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 almost, not entirely, but almost a single-handed process and so, you know, let's first, let's get through this pandemic. Let's all be safe. Um, let's stay well. And then organizationally, I want to, you know, add some staff, of course, and, and we want to get to a point where we are self-sufficient and, and, and running with, uh, you know, an annual event 
uh, I, I think we want to have a, uh, you know, an expanded board. I think we also want to have um, an annual, uh, like, a, almost like a, an award that, or a set of awards that we give out um, on the basis of the five things that we, we uh, that are part of our mission, um, but also maybe how, you know, how are those people pushing the agenda forward in terms of dismantling white supremacy and systemic racism? I, I have to ask a question just because Mike is, is a great colleague of mine and uh, I'm going to mispronounce so many of the names he mentions in this question. Um, but in addition to thanking you for this presentation, he grew up in the Bronx um, during the early years of the Riverside Church, Gauchos and Citywide Games. And do you think that some of the street legends of the game like Earl Manigault um, and Joe Hammond will ever have the opportunity at the Hall of Fame? I, I hope so. <clears throat> I, I hope so. And um, I was just talking to my friend, uh, Donald Hunt, who's a, who's a, a journalist at the Philadelphia Tribune. Um, he's written some great, some great articles and featured HBCU players. And I think that, uh, first of all, the Hall of Fame, I think, could and should have an award that they have. They have the Bob Cousy Award for the best high school players and so on. But why not have, why not also have the best, um, the best HBCU player or the best HBCU coach and name that after somebody like Clarence Big House Gaines. Um, and then the same thing goes for, for, for basketball in terms of the street game. I think there could be a whole category for all the players who were, who were, uh, who were legendary and who fired the imaginations of kids who then themselves became stars and potentially also Hall of Famers. And the stars who played at Rucker Park just alone, um, you know, are, are legendary. Going all the way back to, uh, to Kareem, back then, you know, Lou, Lou Alcindor. Um, Dr. J, um, all the way through to Kobe and, 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 and others, right? So, um, so there's that. And then there's also, there's also uh, you know, just unknown, obscure players who were legendary in their own right or who were community leaders in their own right. Many, many of these players um, were, uh, were lost. We lost them before, before their time. And so um, there's no reason to not include them in some form or fashion, right? Because people were looking up to them. People still looked up to them, even though you know some some of these some of these guys maybe they weren't. Uh, they they nobody was nobody was perfect. Everybody had their own you know personal journey and challenges, but you have to look at the overall body of uh, of of their contribution. I don't know how much time you still have for questions, but there is one that I actually think is really interesting. Jared asks that you spoke of the scientific approach to the game um, that these teams and players brought to, to the game. Um, and can you speak more about how their influence on the game has evolved into what we see today? Um, so let's just break it. So it was the scientific aspect of the, could you, I'm sorry, could you repeat it? I, I, Sure. That, now I have to find it again. <laughs> I clicked answered. Um, okay, you spoke to the scientific approach of the game um, that these teams and players brought to to the game. They say, um, and can you speak more about how that influence on the game has evolved and what into what we see today? So, like, how did the scientific approach yeah. evolve into what is seen today? And as someone who knows nothing about basketball, I don't understand that question at all. <laughs> no, that's a great question. Um, so the, when you think of the scientific, when you think of scientific basketball, um, you immediately have to go to uh, like, it, who plays scientific basketball today? I would say that would be somebody like, um, like the San Antonio Spurs under Greg Popovich or the Golden, Golden State Warriors under Steve Kerr or the Bulls under Phil Jackson. 
um, or even the Celtics during certain, uh, certain uh, parts of their dynasty. Why? Because it just, it just focused on fundamentals, uh, being in the right place at the right time, uh, playing defense. Uh, most people who just watch the game of basketball don't realize the, the, the science behind it. Like there really is science. And now there's literally science with analytics where we can tell um, where is the best spot on the floor for somebody to shoot, not only at all, but at a certain point in time or under these conditions or where this game situation, um, you know, is at stake. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, is, it has become even more scientific, uh, especially with technology. And, and I think, but back then it meant that you were at the right spot at the right time on offense, you were at the right spot on defense, and um, you moved without the ball, uh, you defended away from the ball, uh, you set the right pick, um, you, you uh, uh, communicated on D, um, you followed your man, like all, all those things that coaches now, um, you know, wish uh, that their players would do more. Um, Jonathan asks, um, has the AEA Museum in DC supported your cause with an exhibition? And do you actually have any other exhibitions planned? I know you've had a few, but like, do you have others planned in the future? Yeah, and that's a great question. So to answer that second question first, the Museum of the City of New York right now has an exhibition up on the history of basketball in New York City. And in that exhibition, there's a large section devoted to the Black Fives era where they've uh, they've they've had a loan from us some of our uh, some of our artifacts and so um, if you go in there once they reopen you'll see that, um, that it's it's a it's an amazing exhibition it includes all the things we talked about CCNY Nat Holman the Black Fives era Rucker Park Kobe um, uh, St John's the Knicks um, you know it's it's really it's really fun. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so there's, there's that. And um, uh, now, I've, now I forgot the first part of the question again. Uh, did the museum in DC give you an exhibition though? Okay, right, yeah. Um, so the, the National, uh, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, we do have an image up there that they, uh, that they acquired or um, uh, licensed from us. And, um, and, it, and it's in the, but they don't have much, surprisingly, they don't have much on early black basketball. Uh, they have some, I, I, would, I would hope, or I, 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 I guess it's a dream, or I hope that we, uh, and, and I'm friends and we are uh, affiliated and connected, um, you know, with, with uh, Lonnie Bunch and with, um, the uh, curator of African American history and sports, especially as well, and we've we've tried to um, do some things together. But you know, they're they're busy and they have a much bigger mission than just you know black basketball, and they're trying to cram a lot of things into there. And so um, I'm glad that they have that. But I think eventually they'll uh, expand sports more and have a bigger presence and symposiums and other events that take place there. It's a natural uh, for that to to take place. Yeah. Also, we have, so I, I have to combine like six different questions. Basically, everyone wants to know where they can get merchandise featuring Black Fives logos. Were they like anything to do, like, are you, do you have any collaborations planned? Just a lot, people want to support this and, and, and wear the stuff. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's great. Thank you. I mean, we're planning some things. We don't, there's nothing yet. Like we, we, we did some stuff, you know, a while ago that's, that's maybe on on uh, on uh, on eBay, but um, you know, it, part of it is, uh, and this is just to be totally transparent. Um, but you know, there's just uh, the, like life life happens, right? So if you have kids, we have you know, two three kids, and two of them are in college, and there, there's there's basketball, and there's football, and there's scholar athletes, and 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 recruiting, and and then there's that, and then there's also you know, running the foundation, and then there's also the research and the writing, and then, um, you know, sometimes the last thing, the last thing is, well, what about the merchandise, you know, and so, uh, so um, we're, I, 
I want to get back to that. I want us to have uh, more product, and we, we, we are always in discussion with uh, potential partners. And um, if you want to find out, like if you want to be the first to find out about the <laughs> like when we have something, then go to our website and become a patron. Become a patron on patreon.com. Uh, and so for a dollar a month, you can just get the latest like that I give, uh, I want to shout out to all, all of our patrons who are on, on, on this call um, because uh, that's where you can find out the latest like before anybody else, even before I tweet it. Um, and so, and that's a fun place uh, to be. Um, and again, we, we're trying to constantly uh, do more and be more active socially as well. If, if you don't want to be a patron, that's fine. You can still follow Black Fives or myself on Twitter. Um, on on on, we even have uh, we have a Facebook uh, page. We also have an Instagram uh, page. It's it's we're going to get more active with all of those. Uh, Abe sent in a great question. Um, he was wondering, are there any parallels in the play styles uh, and the push for social change between today's players and uh, the basketball club players that you mentioned? The playing styles, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think so. I think it was just, you had to, um, they, they had to, their strategy had to be a little bit different, right? So you couldn't go, you couldn't go to everywhere and just crush that team and leave because you had to be invited back. So what they did is they would stall and they would keep the score, you know, within a certain realm. Um, there was a lot of uh, side, there was a lot of betting on the side, you know, where people would place bets. And so, you know, sometimes they would probably know, okay, what's the line? Let's make sure we stay within that line. Um, and, and so, you know, the stall, uh, the stalling offense, you know, had to come about because of that. Motion had to come about because, you know, again, like if you went to a town b back in the early days of basketball, it wasn't, the focus wasn't, or the emphasis wasn't on being nimble and agile and fast and quick. It was, if you were a bruiser, if you were big, if you were heavy, if, you know, this is like steel mill, coal workers, um, you know, packing house uh, laborers. And back then you had a rule, which is that actually you could dribble the ball, you could hold the ball and dribble it and catch it with two hands and dribble it again and catch it with two hands and dribble it again and catch there's no, there's no double dribble. So you could just pound your way into the paint, keep pounding your way back and then score. So um, that made it so that, okay, look, let's avoid all that by just running around these guys. And, and so the motion offense um, became part of what African-American teams uh, uh, innovated. And, and, um, and, you know, there were other teams that did it, but they're the ones who, who um, showcased it. And I think that today's players, um, you know, it's the same. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of movement away from the ball. Um, but I wouldn't say that there was, there was any, uh, I mean, obviously the body types are different. We, we as humans have evolved. Um, everybody's taller, everybody's bigger. Game is faster. Um, yeah. Awesome. I have just put a link to both the Black Fives website as well as the, the link to the Black Fives Patreon page uh, oh, in cool. the chat so people can, people can find that. Um, and Oh, there's more questions that I keep missing. Oh, uh, Colin wants to know what the market is for posters like this. I know that they're in incredibly rare, but when one comes up, is it like five grand or is it like 50 grand? I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know the answer. I, you know, we, tr uh, we just try to see if we can get whichever ones we can. A lot of these, I, you know, were, um, I got them a long time ago before there was any interest in, in any of this. But um, if, anybody has a, if anybody has posters or they uh, are considering um, re releasing their posters to a, a, you know, the, 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 the greater, higher cause of uh, helping to educate and, uh, and bring social awareness, then certainly contact us and let us know. Um, but you know, it's, hard to, it's hard to tell right now where and what is going on you know with with that market in terms of in terms of that but here's here's one thing that we are doing 
um, talking to uh, one of my one of my good friends uh, uh, who is um, who is uh, a, a poster designer, and he's a he's a very he's a very talented uh, poster designer. We're going to come up with new modern versions of uh, screen printed, placard printed uh, posters that um, that would be that would be special and collectible and. And so, you know, we're working on we're working on that as well as some other some other interesting prod products that, again, if you if you stay tuned with us, you can also go to our website and just log log in and become. Uh, actually, I think because you signed up here, you'll you'll automatically get added to our mailing list. So uh, that's another way to to uh, to uh, to stay in touch. And you can you can even if you want, you know, send us a donation. And um, we'd be happy to uh, to, uh, to to embrace you and, and bring you on board as well. Uh, yeah, and definitely, if you enjoyed this evening, please check out the Black Fives website, and you can make a donation to contribute to supporting their cause. And you know, poster house too. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, also, those posters that you sound that you're making sound like something that possibly could fit into the poster house gift shop because uh, we love you guys so. Hey. Posters. No, um, you, you, you guys, if you have not been again, even just just going to their website, P Poster House New York, um, is an incredible experience. Just that alone, you'll see. Thank you. Um, I guess I know that there are a, a bunch of little questions that we haven't yet answered. Call if you want to look at a few of them in the in the Q and A button at the bottom. Um, but I think that's all the the big questions having to do with a lot of what we talked about tonight. Um, so unless you see one that you are itching to answer, we have hit the hour and a half mark. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, these are all great questions. <laughs> you know, like, yes, it's, uh, first of all, shout out to Eldra. Hey, Eldra, uh, nice to see you on here. She's one of our patrons. And uh, uh, all of our patrons are very loyal, very generous. And, and um, we have nice little prizes on there. Sometimes we fall behind in terms of sending them out to, to people. And Eldra's very uh, patient with that. So I appreciate that. And that's a great question. You know, Hudson Oliver, Huddy Oliver became a physician, uh, you know, after he played at Howard University. Um, actually, while he was playing, he was in the medical school. Um, and so, you know, I don't know of any other players who had a, a pro from that era who had a pro career as, you know, in medicine or dentistry, but that's something that, um, that I can definitely look into. Um, let's see, uh, in terms of whether or not, this is a, a great, a great question. And first, there, there is a network of descendants. We actually have a page on Facebook. It's a private page, a private group. Uh, that's just for descendants of the Black Fives era, and so just uh, contact me offline, and um, and I'll uh, get you connected, and we'll have a conversation about that. In terms of the Black Fives starting again, what's very interesting is, um, you know, the NBA right now is in a bubble, and it strikes me as wait a minute, they're separated from society. Where have we seen this before? Um, and we've seen it throughout the Black Fives era. That's what that's what that was. So I would I wouldn't be surprised if the players who are in the bubble are talking to one another and saying, "Wait, you know, why do we? Ha I mean, there's always been the question of why can't we start our own league?" And I'm sure that that conversation's been had. And um, you know, I'm not saying that that would be successful or that that has to be the case, but. But I mean, um, why not? You know, it, it, I, I think that's, that's a possibility. It's, 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 it would be hard to do, it's a stretch, but you know, we're talking about a lot of very smart people. Uh, I would probably put LeBron James at the top of that list in terms of being active with his platform, but there's many others, it's not just him. Awesome, well, thank you so much for doing this i know that you and i have talked about doing some sort of programming since we met so finally getting you to do something with poster house has been a real treat for me um 
and I love hearing all your knowledge on this era in basketball history. Cause again, not a sports person, but damn, do I want to be now? <laughs> well, you are now. I mean, cause you, you, you've been part of this. I wish, I wish I could give everybody, you know, a certificate in black fives era poster, uh, mm. you know, uh, knowledge and, um, knowledge about the poster house and, um, you know, it's, it's been a delight. I really appreciate it. I appreciate that you uh, made this time and, and reached out and, and gave, gave us, gave me the, this platform. Uh, it means a lot. And, um, you know, I, I, think, I think it's the beginning of more. Totally. Um, all right. So thank you so much. And guys, please check out both of our websites and email uh, either Claude at his foundation or us at Poster House if you have any other questions or if you want to see more programming like this. We definitely want to know if that's what you want. So let us know. Thank you so much, you guys. Really appreciate it. Night, everyone. Take care.